big fan of his. Um, worked together a bit with him, but uh, really admire his his run as a, a two-time Super Bowl champion with the Pittsburgh Steelers, my team, right, growing up, mm-hmm. uh, protecting big Ben Roethlisberger during his tenure there. Now uh, an analyst for SiriusXM as well as their sideline reporter uh, for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Welcome to the show, Max Starks. Max, welcome to the show, buddy. How you doing? I'm doing good, Ryan, and as always, good to be back on the airways with you, bud. Yeah, it is uh, fun to be with you, too. Um, so Mike Tomlin uh, steps to the mic today and announces that uh, Mitchell Trubisky, uh, who was signed in the offseason, is going to get the first preseason start. I know this doesn't necessarily mean anything, but how are you reading the tea leaves there, and what have you seen in practice with this quarterback competition? Well, uh, Mitch Trubisky, you know, has earned obviously earned the right to be the starter for a Saturday's game against the Seahawks, and he's taking the lion's share of the, of the number one uh, in drills. So no surprise there, and the depth chart dictated that, even though Mike Tomlin will tell you the only reason I gave you a depth chart is because the league mandated that I gave you a depth chart. Right. But for all intents and purposes, you know, Mr. Trubisky has done those things. He's gotten progressively better from the start of camp to where we're at today. Now this afternoon, um, in about, about a half an hour to 45 minutes from now, they're going to step on the field and have another padded practice, another competitive uh, practice uh, before the game. And Mitch has just steadily been better. You can see where the decision-making and the feel for the wide receivers and where he can put the ball for those wide receivers to go out there and make a competitive catch and, and work down the field. He's doing a better job of that. Mason Rudolph, you know, it's funny. You know, he's been in this system. He has a year leg up on Mitch. But he's been actually the most accurate passer in this offense. It's just, I think, with the athleticism of what Matt Kansas is trying to do, Mitch has shined in those moments, a lot of rollouts, you know, off-platform type of throws on the run. He's, he's excelled at that. But when it comes to just pure just passing from the pocket, I mean, Mason's been that better quarterback. And then Kenny Pickett is coming along. I think he had his best day yesterday in practice as far as passing and the relationship with the receivers. But you can see there's still some time that's needed so for this competition, I mean, it, it, it's a pretty good competition. I think it really comes down to 10-2, and two, which is Mitch and uh, Mason Rudolph. As far as who's going to take those starting dues, I think Kenny Pick is a good guy that throws a beautiful fade ball. He has some great decisions that he's making, but it's still coming a little bit slower than I'm sure the coaches would like. And especially when you're talking about working with a third-team offensive line, it gets a little tough. And I think he's done a good job handling that. He does better when he's with the twos. But I think it's right now it's a two-horse race in that, in that competition. In in that aspect, for the coaching staff and maybe the organization, are they are they, you know, would they rather have Kenny Pickett kind of develop this season rather than really kind of be pushing uh, one of those two others for a real starting role because of what it may look like as a rookie? What's the what's the team's um, position around where Kenny Pickett drafted in the first round um, sit this season? Well, I think if you ask the coaches versus the fans, you'll get two completely different answers. Right. The fans want Kenny Pickett, right? He's the native son. He's the guy that literally was on the right side of the, of the building, moving to the left side of the building because the Panthers and the Steelers all train at the same complex. Um, but when you look at it, I think you'd rather have Kenny be, be a guy who can watch. I think you think of like Phillip Rivers, right? You think of Aaron Rodgers. You think of – a lot of quarterbacks who, who sat for a year and then gone on to just have tremendous careers. I think from that perspective, you would rather have Kenny sit. You know, now Ben Roethlisberger was going to sit, but necessity and injuries pushed him to the starting role. I think they'd like the same thing. I don't think they want to come out and name him a week one starter because then what's the point of bringing in Mr. Bisky? You know, what's the point in re-signing Mason Rudolph if the rookie's going to come in and just blow everybody out the water? So I think it's one of those things where it's a process. It's a maturation and I think they would rather see him sit for a year and let the other two duke it out and leave the helm for a year and then come next year training camp, then we make that transition to really giving Kenny a sense of, you know, he's he's going into a position more mature, ready to take the reins, and it's a team that's also ready to receive him. So this is the first – we're talking to Max Starks, uh, Steelers sideline reporter, two-time Super Bowl champion, offensive lineman for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um this is the first camp, right, in a long, long time that Ben Roethlisberger hasn't been at the helm at the quarterback position. Uh, what's the leadership qualities he had, all the things that go into it to have stability at the quarterback position? What, what's it been like? Have guys on the defensive side of the football, have 
uh, others have to have to step up. What's it been like without Big Ben uh, not there this year for camp? Well, I think it, it, it's clear <clears throat> that you're missing kind of the true quarterback leader on the squad, right? A guy that when you could look to offense or defense, right? Defense would look to Ben when they needed help or they're in a pinch and Ben would say, you know what? Let's throw it on my back. Let's go ahead and let's go out and battle. We need to help our defense out. I think now you're looking at it and it becomes more of uh, leadership by committee um, because, you know, Cam Hayward, TJ Watt, they've got the defense on lock. Minka is another leader on that defense. So you have the triangle of leadership on the defensive side of the ball. But when you get to offense, offense is a lot younger crew. Now, there's some veterans on this squad. When you look at James Daniel and Mason Cole, but those guys were brought over in free agency. Um, your wide receiving core, you know, you're looking to guys like Chase Claypool, like Deontay Johnson, who are, who are those unequivocal leaders in that room because they've been here the longest. But you don't see multiple numbers and years <laughs> behind them. This isn't like seven, eight-year receivers. And then you look in the running back room. I mean, Najee Harris is, is a clear clubhouse leader at the running back position, but he was a rookie this time last year. Pat Fryer moved for all intents and purposes. He was a rookie last year. So when you're looking around, it's going to it's gonna turn to Mitch Trubisky, but Mitch has to gain the trust of the team. And you know that, Ryan. As a quarterback, when you have to be able to step in that huddle and get that confidence from them, and he's earning it. And I think he'll earn that first stripe come Saturday when he starts out with the ones as they go, in, go into Akershire Stadium. But at the same time, there isn't a clear guy that's like the standout that's been here for a while. So I think that void is there. And then also that trust, right? Trust that Ben Roethlisberger can bring you back late in the game. You know, we don't have that yet. We don't have that sense because we haven't done it yet. They haven't really had that practice of going through a game, being down, and looking to a guy like Seven to come and pull you out of, out of the fire when things get tight. But they will develop it. But right now, that's where we're looking at. It's more of a committee and guys kind of leaning on each other and having a collective voice versus one person speaking for the team. Uh, you could argue that the uh, AFC North – uh, is one of the most competitive divisions in all of football, right? Right up there with the AFC West uh, this season. Uh, and normally it's been really Pittsburgh and Baltimore, but Cleveland over the last few years and Cincinnati, of course, after last year, have reemerged in this conversation, right? And uh, probably one of the most unknown situations is what 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 happens in Pittsburgh. What, what are the expectations for this team? Mike Tomlin, of course, never having a losing season as a head coach in Pittsburgh. What are the expectations for this team heading into this preseason? Well, I think the expectation is is to take a step forward. That's the first thing. The first step is, you know, at this point in the year in preseason, it's not a team yet. It's a bunch of guys trying to become a team. You have 90 trying to become 53. So the biggest thing is taking a step forward. You have an opportunity, not wasting that opportunity to shine bright on the national stage when this game is televised. And you get to go and do it against somebody that you don't have to walk in the locker room or the dorm room afterwards and explain yourself about why you got hit. I think this is that first opportunity. But I think for the Steelers as a whole, when you're looking globally at what the expectation level is, the expectation level is to go out there and compete and be competitive this year. Just because seven's not a quarterback, you have a, you have a great defense who's coming back and really resurging last year was a down year from the obviously the rushing yards per game given up. They were last in the league, but you also know that there was injuries and everything else. This That group looks healthier. It's still five years in a row leading the league in sacks year in and year out. So we know they can press when you get teams in the passing situation. The biggest question mark is going to be that offense. Can you get off to a fast start? Last year, 37 first quarter points, Ryan, in 17 games. 37 total. Right. That's not in – if not once, that is that, that that puts your defense at a very stressful situation. So the biggest thing is going to come out, prove that you can get off to a fast start. Prove that this Matt Canada offense is explosive and it can put points on the board. That's going to be the first thing. And then that's the first step that they, they really want to take. And then for the defense, it's shoring up that run defense, showing that a team like Seattle who's coming in committed to running the ball, can you stop them from running the football? Those are the first two things I'm looking for this Saturday. We're talking with Max Starks here on the Mercedes Vans Vans phone line, uh, two time Super Bowl champion with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, an off season in which something very near and dear to your heart, the the name of the stadium that you were uh, that you played your entire career in, um, gets a gets a new facelift. What I, I mean, there was kind of a viral response to it. Um, but it, it is part of what the the you know, the business world is now, but what was your takeaway when the, when the change went away from Heinz field? 
Well, I think the, I, I had the same reaction as a lot of fans. I was like, what? What do you mean it's not Heinz Field anymore? And what is Acrisure? I don't even know what Acrisure is. And you're like, why are they coming in and ruining a Pittsburgh tradition? Because, you know, you had the Heinz ketchup factory that's literally right on the north side, the same side as the stadium. You still see the, the, um, the memorial, like the, the smokestacks from, from the factory still standing, and now it's like lofts and everything else. But that's just as Pittsburgh as it gets. And so to see the ketchup bottles being being lowered, I watched the video of them being lowered from the end zone because obviously when you hit the Heinz red zone, the ketchup bottles tilt and they pour into the screen and it's a cool moment. But now for it to be accurate, I mean, that's the growth and that's where we are from the business side of the NFL. If there's an opportunity for these organizations to make money, to continue to build their brands, you know, when you see the Denver Broncos going for the exorbitant amount of money for billions of dollars, you have to wonder, okay, well, what can we do to maximize our profits as well so that we can stay viable and continue to grow this game and also grow the, you know, the arm of the NFL as far as their philanthropic you know, efforts and interests as well as just growing this game internationally. you got you, you got to build the war chest, right, before you want to go out and, and conquer across the ocean. So I think that's just kind of the nature of what it is. It's a natural thing. We'll get used to saying Acrisure Stadium instead of Heinz Field over time. But, uh, it, you know, it's one of those things where you see a little bit of the nostalgia kind of go away and it becomes something new. And hopefully, you know, you could build a new tradition for whatever quarterback it is. Pickett, Trubisky, Rudolph. Now you can start building your own name. Ben had all the Heinz Field records. Now see if you can get some Acrisure Stadium records. I like it. I like it. Uh, you talk about legacy and history, right? Uh, I grew up a Pittsburgh Steelers fan, right? Uh, growing up yeah. in Montana, we didn't have uh, a pro team anywhere. So... Um, we had relatives in Pittsburgh, and they would send along the uh, uh, the iron beer cans with the team oh, yeah. the team picture on it. Um, and I loved the black and yellow and Terry Bradshaw. And I've watched it over time. And what's been so impressive about this organization, and you can speak firsthand to this, is what the Rooney family has been able to do. Right, uh, three head coaches in 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 the in the time frame I've been alive. And being a Steelers fan, I mean, the consistency, the winning, the pedigree and uh, the tradition is is unparalleled, I believe, in this in this league. Speak to that a little bit, what the Rooney family has done and the tradition and history of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Well, we all know, you know, that years 1970, really, uh, you have the AFL NFL merger, but you have something else. You have this influx of talent. A guy by the name of Joe Green gets drafted <laughs> and. And from that point forward, we know that's the origin of what we know the Steelers to be. A new standard was set. We can go back into the 60s and the 50s and the 40s. Of course, they were founded in 1933. But that's a checkered past, right? There was a, there was a year they even they formed during World War II where they formed with Philadelphia and became the Steagles. You know, there, there's a lot of history. But 70 is a defining moment where you hire Chuck Knoll the year before. And then he is his first draft class. And then we know what the 70s are. That, that is the Steelers' decade. When you're talking about decades for NFL teams, that was the Steelers unequivocally. And from there, a standard was set. And the standard was, we're going to be tougher than everybody else out there. We're going to play a physical brand of football. And that has transcended. That's one of the things that when we think about the Steelers, whether it's a Steeler fan or not, you think of Pittsburgh, you automatically, like, ooh, that's going to be a rough game. That's going to be a physical altercation. Uh, when, when you step in that stadium or when they come into ours and you knew you were going to feel it the next week. And I think that's kind of what's permeated. It started with the steel curtain and it's carried on today. And that's one of the things I think about and what makes it special. And, and, it, and it starts with the steadiness at the top. The Rooney name has been associated with leading this franchise since its inception. And to be passed down from father to son and to now father to son, again, what, it, it's, uh, it's something that, you don't take for granted. And, you know, this is my first year coming back for training camp. I was hired last year to come in in the sideline uh, duties when, uh, you know, the great Tunch Ilkin passed away. And, and I was asked if, if I could come in and not replace, but simply come in and, and assist with the broadcast because right. you can't replace Tunch. But, you know, it, being around the guys, being here at St. Vincent's, which before COVID, 54 straight years where training camp was held here in Latrobe, PA, at St. Vincent's College. So every Hall of Famer that we know in the modern era has started here on those same exact fields that we practice on today. 
and that's the proving ground, right? That's the forge before you can make steel. You come out here to become a team that then goes down to Pittsburgh and performs on every Sunday and every other football day. And I think that that's an important thing. But the Roonies are here. You see them every day. Mr. Rooney's in the lunchroom. I, was, I just saw him earlier. And you see everybody around this organization just embrace it. Coach Tomlin, we had a, had, a, had a conversation with him, you know, in the dorms. Everybody's available and everybody's growing. And I think that's something that we don't get in a lot of places. You know, you know, I, I had I had the unfortunate opportunity to go to San Diego and I went to St. Louis and it was just, it was different. And now those teams are both in L.A., which is crazy that <laughs> those two sites are no longer existent. But it's a different sense. And, and you see when it's an older organization that's been passed down through the history of the NFL and over five decades plus of security, it makes it crazy to think three head coaches. How many, how many coaches have the Browns gone through in the last six years? And if you think of the Steelers since 1970, yep. they've only had three total head coaches. And the current one is on his 16th season, and he's never had a losing season to this point. He has something to defend, and that's just tremendous. And all of them have Super Bowl victories. All three of those coaches have Super Bowl victories under their belts, and it just goes to show that the standard that they've created is just something that, you know, when you get here, you're somewhere special. Well, I, I know – I know why I've loved them for so long, and, and this will be for uh, this will be another great year for me to follow my team, and I'm so happy that you're a part of it this year, and uh, you'll be my first call when I on some insight on what's going on there in Pittsburgh. Max Starks, everybody, thanks for joining us, buddy. Man, thanks for having me, Ryan. Take care. Yes, sir. All righty, Max Starks, former two-time Super Bowl champion uh, there in Pittsburgh, now their sideline reporter.